it looks like businesses are finally learning their lesson. They are finally learning that you should avoid hiring Wokies like the plague because they kind of are a plague. Because guess what? They're not going to work. They're, they're not here to work. Their only goal is to use your resources and your platform for activism. They don't give a fuck about your company. They don't give a fuck about making money. They will do whatever they can to use your business as a tool, as a platform for their activism. Why any business owner in their right mind would hire someone like this, I don't know, but they have been doing so recently. But it looks like there's at least a few companies out there who are finally learning their lesson. Uh, even though the, the, I believe this article is from the perspective of someone who's actually defending the Wokies, but we still get a lot of very useful information out of here. Here's how professional union busters talk about woke tech organizers. A law firm webinar advised employers on how to avoid becoming a target of code and organizing initiative in tech and video game industries. Yeah, you want to avoid hiring activists and actually hire regular fucking people who want to just do their jobs and get paid? That's actually pretty easy because every activist I know doesn't try to hide their activism. When you get a resume and the first thing on that resume is extracurricular activities and activism, and then maybe experience and previous employment history is listed in a footnote somewhere instantly dump that in the garbage bin. If I see any activism on a resume, I just instant disqualification. And why would you feel it's so important to put your activism activities on this resume? It's almost as if you're trying to tell me that you only view my company as a platform for which to do your activism. Well, unlike these idiots, I'm, I'm looking, I'm listening, I'm paying attention. And uh, if these law firms keep doing these webinars, they keep spreading the word, maybe some of these other companies can be saved before it's too late. Yeah, some others, uh, it's already too late, but uh, there's a few that may still be salvageable. On July 30th, the employment and labor law firm Jackson Lewis put on a one-hour webinar designed to educate employers on a new threat, a wave of union organizing in the video game and technology industries. More specifically, it promised to teach them to defend against it. You guys can take this however you want, but I'm just going to say I have never in my life seen actually good productive employees try to unionize. It was always people with a very inflated opinion of themselves. Activism and trying to organize was the only thing they knew how to do. It's almost as if they came out of college and all they learned was how to be a professional activist, and they're putting it to use as best they can. Huh. It must just be a funny coincidence. I'm sure there's a few good ones out there. The webinar called Breaking the Code, Union Organizing in the Video Game and Technology Industries, focused on a group called Campaign to Organize Digital Employees, or CODE, which was formed in January of current year by the Communications Workers of America. CODE won its first campaign in March when it successfully organized employees at the communication software startup Glitch. I wonder if they're still around. And uh, it is part of an unprecedented surge of tech worker activism. Well, how did that work out for, for Kickstarter, I wonder? Like, they actually did unionize. I wonder what happened to... The oh, right. They, they, they are really fucking hurting right now. Well, not my fucking problem. Throughout the last couple of years, Microsoft employees have protested the company's work with ICE. Google employees have protested the company's work with police departments. And Amazon workers walked out in protest of the company's response to the beer virus. And I'm sure they were all fired and replaced. Meanwhile, a group of tech contract workers for Google, Kickstarter employees, and a small subset of uh, Instacart workers have voted to unionize. Yeah, Kickstarter actually did unionize, and then they had to lay off like 30% of their staff because uh, they're losing, was it like 30% of their fucking money? And just this Wednesday, in a move particularly relevant to code, hundreds of employees at the video game giant Blizzard Entertainment organized a list of requests for management, including fair pay and increased vacation time. Get in touch. We can do this twatted code in reference to a suggestion that the employees should form a union. Now, here's how I imagine this is going to play out. 
if Blizzard management actually agrees to to allow this union to happen, Activision is probably just going to shut down the Blizzard side of the company and fire everyone, transfer the IPs over to Activision, and then maybe hire some of the uh, the actual good workers on uh, to to kind of rebuild. Like Blizzard would just be one like one small studio under the Activision umbrella. A sign-up page for the webinar explained it would discuss the CWA's likelihood, uh, likely organizing strategies, ways to proactively address employee workplace issues, and how to lawfully address union organizing in your business. Well, yeah, th- there are ways, but absolute worst case, just just shut it down. Transfer all of the uh, like the intellectual property and shit to you or to another company. Shut that one down. Reform it later. Hire back the good people. This is actually how a lot of these companies get away with uh, – because uh, some countries and some states, it's almost impossible to fire someone. So when these companies build up too much useless bloat employees, that's how they get rid of them. They do mass layoffs, and then they they just shuffle things around. They hire back the few good people. It, it's a very common strategy. One zero registered for and attended the webinar, which provided a rare window into how employers in the tech and video game industry are being advised to ward off tech workers' burgeoning interest in unions. Now, from what I've seen in the in the gaming industry, they are not doing this at all. They are just they are racing to the bottom. Part of it is perhaps the uh, younger, more woke component of the workforce. Maybe it's just a more socially active era we're in, but it's clearly an, an element of this kind of organizing that we're seeing. The host of the webinar, a principal at Jackson Lewis's Boston office named Patrick L. Egan, uh, classified the new wave of tech organizing and activism as distinct from the others because of its emphasis on the company values rather than employee wages, benefits, and treatment. He cited walkouts and petitions focused on issues such as pay equity, inequality between contractors, subcontractors, and employees, and the type of work an employer is engaged in. For instance, working with the Pentagon, ICE, or law enforcement, explaining that this type of activism overlaps with organizing in the tech and video game industries. Without citing a source, he said that there had been more than 100 instances of employee activism in tech last year. Dude, if you just watch, if you pay attention to, like, say, the gaming media, we've probably had at least 100 a month. Three times more than the year before and nine times more than in current year minus four. This has a whole different dynamic to it, he said. Part of it is the younger, more woke component of the workforce. Maybe it's just a more socially active area we're in, but it's clearly an element of this kind of organizing that we're seeing. Yeah, we already just heard that highlighted. In the Kickstarter organizing campaign, how'd that work out for you, Kickstarter? A debate about Kickstarter removing a comic book called uh, Always Punch Nazis, which employees perceived as caving to political pressure, started the unionizing effort. So if you guys aren't aware of what went down on Kickstarter, here's what's funny. Kickstarter was one of the few companies that actually fairly enforced their own fucking rules. They actually followed their own fucking terms of service, guidelines, whatever. There was no double standards. They said, uh, I mean, they they were forced into, um, by their Trust and Safety Council, banning things that glorified violence and all this, uh, whatever other buzzwords they use. And then a book came out that was literally all about teaching you how to be violent against people you disagree with. And then they like, okay, you know, you're right. This does violate our terms of service. We're going to remove this. And the woke employees were so butthurt that they dared evenly enforce their own standards that they unionized just so they could uh, they could revoke that ban and decide what books get banned and not and which ones don't. And look at how that went out. Uh, look how that ended up for them. Most employees in a union want to influence the decisions in terms of their pocketbook. Here we have employees wanting to shape company values. Yeah, th- this is what we call a useful idiot. They are just being used and abused for someone else's sake. And when they're not useful anymore, they will be discarded. Again, describe the approach of code as slow, methodical, and tailored to each workplace. Of one of the group's organizers, Wes McEnany, he said, based on his twats, he is a dyed-in-the-wool socialist, is very aggressive. He's an in-your-face type of organizer. He'd be like a dog on a bone. 
of the other co-organizer, Emma Kinema, who is also a founder of a network of game workers with more than 20 global chapters called Game Workers Unite. He said she's really good at understanding what is required to successfully organize. Yeah, anyone who has an association with these lunatics, just, just, just don't, don't associate with them. These guys have clearly stated that you know, they are more than happy to, let can to allow cancel culture to work. So fine. Just uh, realize that if you support cancel culture, we're not going to let you take that back once we replace your industry. Just, just keep that in mind. They're going to organize anywhere from video game startups to the largest tech companies in the country. They're going to organize contractors and subcontractors. We've seen both already, and they're going to organize across disciplines. I I'm not really too worried. I mean, when it comes to Sick Fox Studios, if you just treat your people well, they're not going to and, and filter out all these woke morons. The, the, those are the two important things. Treat your people well and don't hire these woke idiots. Now, I only hire people with talent. So there's no, no chance of any woke idiots ever ending up here anyway. So that, that kind of fixes itself. But really just treat them well and they'll feel no need to fucking organize. He said the key part of code strategy was to overcome the idea that unions weren't for white collar workers in tech and video games and to teach workers that their dream job could still be improved. As he put it, convincing the employees that even though you're doing your life's work, you've arrived, you're here, that there's more to it than that. That it can be better, that it can be fairer, that it can be more transparent, and we can deal with the unfairness and the lack of voice that you feel. For instance, employees may not be able to avoid crunch time or periods of long hours before a deadline. That's actually very easy to avoid. There's the fact that the vast majority of deadlines are arbitrary. The only deadlines that I would actually even give the slightest shit when it comes to meeting are, are those deadlines where it's like, a, oh, yeah, these terrorists took a hostage and they said if we don't get this done in a day, they're going to kill the hostage. That's a deadline that has to be met. But the vast majority of deadlines, especially in the game industry, it's just managers may set an arbitrary deadline and you have to have it done by then. Fucking Blizzard of all companies. Blizzard used to fucking have that uh, it'll be done when it's done policy. And now look at them putting out garbage. Okay, uh, but code may tell them they could play a role in deciding how much and when overtime has worked and how much they are compensated for it. And then you're just going to get fired and replaced. And if uh, you make it illegal to fire you, the company's going to get shut down and you're going to be replaced when they come back online. Again, identified layoffs, job security, and fairness between subcontractors, independent contractors, and employees as particular vulnerabilities to employers. Saying Code had recognized uh, organizing subcontractors in particular as the greatest immediate opportunity for success in Silicon Valley. And uh, they're not wrong there. Because uh, they Silicon Valley companies exploit independent contractors something fierce. A lot of times they pay these guys peanuts and they overwork them, but they say, oh, yeah, once you finish this contract, you may have a full-time position at our company waiting for you, and then they just never deliver. So I could see why they'd start here. You are probably quite aware that a misclassification can be expensive in a wage and hour lawsuit, but it can also breed resentment, which can fuel a union organizing campaign since uh, independent contractors won't have benefits. Their wages may be different and they're working side by side with folks who've got a different, better package. It's a really volatile mix. In the most famous, famous example of tech employee misclassification lawsuit, Microsoft in 2000 agreed to pay $97 million to 1,000 uh, temp workers who were alongside its employees but wore different color badges and did not enjoy the same stock benefits, health benefits, or pensions. Now, this I could, again, also understand. If you are doing the exact same work, the exact same hours, you are not an independent contractor anymore. You are pretty much a full-time employee. The best way for an employer to make itself an unattractive target to code, Egan said, is to be proactive. He suggested training supervisors, talking up uh, positive aspects of the workplace, or blowing your horn, identifying and addressing workplace issues before unionization efforts started, and talking with employees about the downside of unions. Now, now this actually is all, this very good advice. This is very good advice because uh, at, the, at the core, what this paragraph, uh, what they're saying is... You fuckers know these problems exist. So if you just finally fix them yourselves instead of waiting for the union to show up, 
you can head the union off at the pass. Get some easy wins, he said. Communicate it, take credit for it, and show your employees that you're on the job and you understand that they're, uh, what their legitimate workplace needs are and you're taking actions both immediate and planned to address them. Th that is not bad advice. Another tactic, again, discussed for employers to proactively identify employees who would want outside or, or inside of a uh, bargaining unit and adjust their responsibilities to strengthen the case that they either are or are not supervising managers and thus el eligible or ineligible for representation by a union. He said that this is only feasible for you before a union campaign. And while it shouldn't be the only factor driving these kinds of decisions about their responsibilities, it's a factor. And now is the time to make that analysis. You know what another possibility is? Don't hire bloat. If you only hire the best of the best and you don't get in their way and you make sure they're taken care of and they can do their jobs, they're not going to give a fuck about unions. Talking points again recommended for employers included reminding workers about union dues and uncertainty over what will ultimately end up in a union contract if workers do form a union. It's like the company picnic. Everyone gets a t-shirt, a medium, he said, of union contracts. <laughs> and then not to mention, what if the company's just like, all right, fuck this. We're just going to shut down. I'm just going to cash out the money that's in the company and I'm going to retire early and you guys are on your own. Bye-bye. A spokesperson for Code said of the seminar, the information shared about Code CWA seems to be a mixture of OK Boomer and lines cut and pasted from articles highlighting what we're doing to help the tech and game workers build power and improve their workplaces. How seriously are you going to treat it, though? That's that's going to be the big indicator. Jackson Lewis did not respond to a request for comment. Though the technology and video game industries have seen unionization efforts in the past, the companies in the sectors are notoriously difficult to organize. If Blizzard Entertainment were to unionize, it would be the first major U.S. video game company to do so, according to Bloomberg. And it would also be the first major U.S. video game company to be disbanded by its parent company for, for unionizing. And uh, then, they're, like, like I was saying before, if Activision really doesn't want this union at Blizzard, they will just shut down Blizzard completely, take all the IPs for themselves, form a new internal studio, maybe even call it Blizzard, and hire back the people who, uh, who weren't bloat. And we may actually get good games from Blizzard again if that were to happen. That would be kind of fucking cool. Fuck yeah, go ahead, Blizzard, do this. I want to see where this goes. The tech industry has always had this stereotype of this uh, freewheeling, super open work cultures and their liberal politics, but it's never been tested in the sense of the type of activism we've seen over the past couple of years. Well, well Kickstarter tested it and uh, the expected result occurred, says John Logan, a professor of labor and employment studies at San Francisco State University who studies the union avoidance industry. Oh, so, so he's one of the rats. Like he's, he's like spying on them and ratting them out. But arguably, they are more anti-union than many sectors in the U.S. economy because they have an obsession with unilateral control of the workplace. They might think, yeah, unions are getting necessary in Walmart or wherever it is, but they're, complete, they're completely antithetical to what we do. And honestly, they are. The way the current AAA games industry is run, if you unionized these companies, they would go bankrupt. Again, see Kickstarter. And not in the game industry, but the, I think Kickstarter counts as a tech company last I checked. U.S. union membership has dropped significantly over the last several decades. While in 1983, 16.8% of private sector employees belonged to a union, as of last year, just 6.2% were union members. Probably because uh, the, the major companies that they were able to get unionized, they just, they just shut down. And nope, we're here to make money, and this is going to cost us money. Therefore, we're going to go out of business. See you guys later. Employers, meanwhile, spend more than $340 million per year on union avoidance services like those offered by Jackson Lewis. Seems to be working. According to an analysis from the Economic Policy Institute based on reports filed with the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Labor Management Standards. And that's it for this article. And I will be really interested to see where this goes. Oh man, I am so excited to tell you guys right now that finally, after about a year of build-up and shilling, we have launched Blade Devil on Indiegogo, and so far it is doing so well thanks to awesome people like you. If you haven't backed it yet, then please check the links in the description and check out Blade Devil on Indiegogo. You will not be disappointed. Looking forward to seeing you there.